Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. As you join, please mute and turn off your video. We're going to be starting in about one minute in order to preserve and honor our time for the hour. Thank you. All right, it's 7.05, we're gonna get started. This is town hall number, I'm gonna say four for now until someone corrects me, thank you. This is our 7 p.m. town hall, 11, 22, 21. Um, we thank everyone for joining. We also thank our negotiating team for their time and labor to sit here for this hour and answer any questions to gain clarifying um, clarification and understanding as it relates to our TA2. Um, some housekeeping notes again, please make sure that when you join the YouTube, go on YouTube to join the JetBlue IFC um, channel. It has all of the videos available for you, including all of our previous town halls so that you can um, again, remain uh, well uh, knowledgeable as to our TA2 and also go back and view previously answered questions and unpacked articles. So we're going to go into our first article unpacking. That's going to be article number 20. That is disciplinary grievances, page 93. And we're going to throw that to Sonia. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for uh, joining us um, to learn more about TA2. Um, I'm going to talk about disciplinary grievances. Um, it's a short but unbelievably powerful article. And uh, if you didn't know that this entire article is a win, this the disciplinary grievances, non-disciplinary grievances, grievances is the foundation of the contract. So uh, this is something that is the whole point of, of fighting so hard to, uh, to have this in place. Um, so the disciplinary grievance is going to handle uh, when, if and when, throughout the duration of your career, you run into a situation in which the company wants to um, discipline or discharge you. So discipline is going to be a, a progressive guidance level. So you've done something uh, not worthy of termination, uh, but worthy of discipline or discharge, which is going to be termination from the company. Um, so again, this is for non-probationary IFCs. As we covered um, yesterday, we talked a little bit about the probationary period. So non-probationary IFCs um, uh, fall under this. So this will um, states that you will not be disciplined without just cause. And just cause is a reasonable and lawful ground for action. So uh, disciplinary action will not be imposed on an IFC without an impartial, reasonable, and expeditious investigation. So what that means is that a meeting has to be held between uh, the VP of in-flight or their representative, the IFC and a union rep if they desire to have one there, which they should. And the meeting has to be held within 21 days of the company finding out about the event. So that puts a real tight time frame and uh, can't come, you know, six months down the line, if something pops up on social media and now the company hears about it. Um, it's, it's really gotta be, Within uh, and then they they choose to do something. It's like once they hear about the in, the incident, they have 21 days to have this meeting with you, and then um, you have to have three business days notice to have the meeting. And what that does is then it just you know puts the time frames around that, and uh, have and um, excuse me, this now stops there from being any sort of like blindsidedness. It's like you find out about the incident, they contact you, a meeting is scheduled. So now if uh, during this time frame you are removed from your trips pending investigation, you're now pay protected. So there's not this just sitting at home waiting to see what happens. You know that you're pay protected. And um, after this, uh, you will find out a little bit more about the investigation. I should also say that uh, the big thing here is that if you are pulled for a drug or alcohol failure, this does not apply. So this is only for um, non-drug or alcohol related uh, issues. 
So if the investigation does lead to discipline or discharge, the IFC will receive a written statement of the facts, the precise charges, the action taken, whether it's going to be PG or termination, and then you'll be given 21 days from the date of the first meeting at that point. So you now, again, these are tight time frames that you now know you are being charged with whatever this incident was. Again, removing this whole uh, scenario that we currently have where you're called into an office, you're blindsided, you're given a phone call, bombs are dropped on you to just come in and you have no clue what's going on. This is really making an entire procedure that explains exactly what the infraction was, what the issue was, why you're being called in, and what the level of, um, of punishment, for lack of a better word, is going to be. So now um, you've got this meeting, it's taken place, you know what's going on. Um, as a sidebar, letter of conversations, these can be had, um, they're not considered discipline. If a letter of conversation takes place, you'll receive a copy, and you actually also will receive a copy anytime something is put into your personnel file. So this is kind of really giving you onus to understand um, where you are in your, your level of, I hate to say the word career, but just basically knowing where you stand with any sort of incidents that may further um, harm you down the road, because a lot of these are look backs. If certain things happen regularly, the company then come back can come back and say, you know, we want to have a meeting with you about a pattern of behavior that's happening. Excuse me, I just want to make sure I'm getting off a little bit from my notes. Okay, so then what happens is, is if, as after the outcome of this meeting, you are disciplined or discharged, you can now file an appeal. And that's where the grievance comes into play. You are saying that I don't agree with the outcome of this meeting and whatever the company's investigation has uncovered. And now you file the grievance. And so you're going to have either the filing for the um, appeal to remove the progressive guidance or get your job back. And that's this is something we've never had before. If you're terminated here, you can try to appeal to the company. There are some, um, there's some language about that in the um, IDBS, but the chances of you getting your job back are very slim to none. But now you actually have an appeal process that will go in front of the System Board of Adjustment, which you'll learn about in a little bit. And you have a little bit of power here to try to get your job back. So this falls into another 21 day cycle. So uh, once you file this grievance that you'd like to have an appeal, you've got 21 days from the ruling. Um, and what happens now is that once you file that, the company has to now come back again. They have to take this seriously. They have to say, okay, we're going to come back here and, and state our case again. If they decide to ignore that within that 21 days, the crew member wins. And that's a wonderful thing. And then the um, grievance becomes denied and appealed. If something comes back and the IFC has to provide more information and they don't, then the, there's a chance that that um, action could now be um, permanent and sustained. So a wonderful thing here, um, if an IFC does lose their job and they win the arbitration, it gets a case number. It becomes precedent setting. So what this means is that if an IFC is terminated and down the road, another IFC is terminated for the same reason, you now have something that you can go back to and say, hey, this IFC was terminated and got their job back for the same reason. Let's reference that case here and see if there were a lot of the same uh, similarities or certain situations. So you now have like a foundation to refer back to when other IFCs um, are terminated and get their jobs back. Um, the last thing of the, um, the disciplinary grievance article that I'd like to go over is that this actually sets a... Um, a time frame that the company and the union meets regularly, right? So they're going to meet quarterly to discuss grievances that have been filed. Not every grievance gets um, escalated to the system board, to the arbitrator. A lot of them are, are rectified just on the local level. I mean, taking it to a higher uh, level is very, very costly. So there are a lot of things that can be um, um, taken care of just on the local level between the union and the company. Um, and that's basically the, the the foundation of the disciplinary, excuse me, the disciplinary grievance. So thanks for tuning in. All right, thank you, Sonia. Sonia represents Boston. She is also an OBL, part of the negotiating team. We're gonna move on to article 21. In your hymnals page 95, non-disciplinary -discipl disciplinary grievances, that's gonna be um, 
Stacy is going to be taking that. She is your JFK negotiating team member. Thank you, Stacy. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to be with you again this evening. So um, now we're going to move on to the non-disciplinary grievances. And we are all used to the concept of us being pulled into the office and being held accountable. We are not accustomed to being able to hold the company accountable. And that is what non-disciplinary grievances do. They hold the company accountable the same way we are held accountable. Um, so first of all, your first step is to, um, you know, you're gonna speak to a base manager and you're gonna see if this can be resolved, uh, whatever the issue is before it goes to a grievance. Um, failing that, you can't resolve the matter. Um, if it's something other than uh, discipline or discharge, um, your grievance is going to be submitted to the vice president of in-flight or her or his designee, um, and that's going to be within 60 days from the time the IFC knew or could reasonably have known of the event giving rise to the grievance. Same language we have is in the uh, disciplinary grievance, but now it's reversed on them. So um, we get 60 days from when we should, we should or could have known, uh, which is really nice. And... Um, from there, the investigation or hearing shall be held by the vice president. So they're going to look into the matter. Um, and that's going to be within 30 days. That investigation has to happen after they receive notification. And then within 30 days of the close of the investigation and hearing, uh, the company is going to render a decision to the grievant. And the uh, union will also get a copy of that. Um, once we have that notification, uh, if the decision is not to our liking, uh, the union can appeal that decision to the uh, JetBlue in-flight crew member board of adjustment. And that's a submission that goes into the board within 30 days after the union receives that decision that we do not agree with. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the, the process there. Um, the IFC is uh, entitled to the union representative once that has been filed. And uh, there are time limits here, as you've heard, and the time limits prescribed in this section can be waived by mutual consent. Um, in the absence of that agreement, the failure of an IFC to grieve or appeal any grievance within the time limits causes that to be denied and settled. Um, if the hearing or decision required of the company is not provided when the time limits um, or an extension agreed upon, then the IFC can consider the grievance appealed and the, uh, the next step in the grievance procedure uh, follows. So the time periods and uh, decisions again are considered maximum periods. They can't be dragged out. Um, Disputes that are resolved prior to the filing of a grievance, because a dispute at any time in the process can be settled. Um, the IFC can decide that they are satisfied with the company's uh, decision. The company can decide they would like to come to an agreement before it goes to arbitration. Um, if, it, if it is settled, it is not precedent setting. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily... Um, that you can't wind up with a side letter um, or some kind of letter of agreement coming out of it, but it's not automatic. If it goes to arbitration, then that is, um, that is precedent setting. And again, as Sonia talked about, what that means is that's a decision that is used going forward. Um, these can wind up being used to impact any IFC who has a, a same or similar situation. Um, uh, an interesting case Tom was telling me about, this is a really great example that we can all relate to. Um, an IFC was assigned a pairing that was 10 minutes out of bounds of what they were supposed to have been assigned. Um, the IFC wanted to be compensated for the pairing and the company said, well, we'll, you know, we'll give you double time for, uh, for the 10 minutes that were out of bounds. Well, that's not an acceptable solution. You know, 10 minutes, what's that to the company that doesn't, that doesn't cost them anything. That's not a deterrent to, uh, to continue violating the contract in that way. Um, in this instance, um, a grievance was filed. Eventually it was settled prior to going to arbitration. And the argument was made that um, not only was the 10 minutes outside of bounds illegal, but the entire assignment 
was actually um, illegally assigned. And so the IFC was compensated uh, double pay for that entire assignment. And because at that airline, they did not have any double pay at the time. That was, uh, that was a really nice decision for that IFC or that flight attendant. Um, and in that case, um, it did open up the door for double time payment for other instances. So that was, that was a situation where we can see how the grievance process is so beneficial to our flight attendants. All right, thank you, Stacy. Stacy just unpacked Article 21, non-disciplinary grievances. Again, I have shared for everyone the supplemental Canva that can go with that. Um, please review at your leisure um, so that you can gain a more uh, better understanding as to that particular article. The last article we're unpacking tonight will be handled by Brendan. He's the fabulous negotiating team, mem team member that is from the, our LAX base, Los Angeles. He's going to be doing Article 22, System Board of Adjustment, um, as well as Article 30, General and Miscellaneous. So we're going to start on page 97 in our hymnals, and I'm going to give this to Brandon. Thank you. Thanks, Taisha. That was quite the introduction. I appreciate you for it. Um, and I thank Stacy and Sonia as well for their um, thorough review of um, both disciplinary and non-disciplinary grievance articles. And as they both indicated, those two articles and including Article 22, System Board of Adjustment, are uh, not the lengthiest articles in the agreement, but I would, I would, uh, argue the three most important uh, articles in the entire agreement. Because without these three articles, you, we would not really have a CBA that could be enforced. These are the enforcement mechanisms for how the contract, uh, once ratified, will, will be put into force and uh, that force maintained. And so <clears throat> as both Sony and Stacy said, the grievance process is a multi-step process. And ultimately, the ultimate step in that process is the filing of the grievance in front of a, what is called the System Board of Adjustment. And the System Board of Adjustment is the ultimate step in the process, in the grievance process. Uh, the, the board is made up of three members. One member is chosen by our union. One member is chosen by the company. And a third member is agreed upon by both the company and the union. And that third part, that third member of the board is a neutral member and also known as, as the arbitrator. So that board, the system board, is established to adjudicate or decide, resolve any disputes between our union and the company as to in the instance of a disciplinary grievance, that would be, as Sony described, uh, something that had to do with a, an, an in-flight crew member being disciplined and in our view as a union unjustly and something was not done correctly in that investigation or the uh, discipline did not fit the infraction or the um, supposed infraction and or a... <clears throat> non-disciplinary grievance, which is some violation of our collectively bargained agreement. And so uh, ultimately, if the union and the company can't decide on a agreeable resolution prior to submitting the grievance to the board, the arbitrator can make an ultimate final and binding decision when it comes to uh, the outcome of that grievance. And the, the arbitrator or the board I should say, it's a majority vote. So two votes carry the decision. And so the system board of adjustment is just the ultimate decider of uh, disputes between uh, the union and the company. Um, just checking my notes. Yeah, I think that covered most of what I wanted to cover on the system board of adjustment, but just in general, when it comes to having a grievance procedure 
uh, and then ultimately being able to file for an arbitrator to, to make a determination on the validity of the claim, that just changes everything about the way we uh, relate to the company and the company relates to us as individuals, but more importantly, as a union. And having a grievance procedure in place is, is just uh, invaluable. And so um, I would highly encourage people to um, look into what having a grievance procedure means, ask questions about what grievances are, how important they are, why they're important, and all of those things, because um, this is what makes our contract a contract and one that we can enforce. Uh, I would just say, when it comes to the arbitrator, uh, the arbitrator is one that is chosen from a list, uh, a neutral arbitrator, and if the company and the union can't agree on who that is, there's a list that the names are stricken from until there is a final name on the list, and then that uh, individual will be the uh, head of the system board, the neutral on the system board um, to make those decisions, more majority decisions of the board. I um, think that's everything I wanted to cover. Going on to general and miscellaneous. Uh, general and miscellaneous article 30, which uh, Taisha is on 149, page 149 for those listening. Um, this is an article that, as the name indicates, covers a wide variety of topics that may not have had a particular uh, fit in another article. And this just covers a, a wide range of topics. And it's not long, so you, you can certainly review it on your own. But there were a few things I wanted to mention when it comes to the general miscellaneous article uh, point out for to highlight. One of which it, it uh, guarantees all of us, uh, once we ratify the contract, uh, the right to wear our union pins uh, on our uniforms, and that's uh, ultimately a sign of so, you know a sign of solidarity, you know one that we take pride in. And uh, certainly, uh, once we have our union in place, wearing your union pin is a great way to show your support and uh, and be involved and engaged with our union. So I'm looking forward to the to the, to when we can have the right to wear our union pins on on our uniforms. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to highlight, because I don't, I'm not sure, uh, some, some may not be totally familiar with our, uh, the TWU Committee on Political Education, that's our COPE, uh, political action, um, committee, and in the general and miscellaneous article, we were able to get language that it, allows our union to have voluntary checkoffs uh, on paychecks for people who, in-flight crew members who want to contribute to our union's political action committee, our COPE um, Committee on Political Education. And it's because our dues, our regular dues, our $35 a month dues that we will be uh, deducting from our paychecks are not allowed to go to any sort of political um, uh, advocacy. We have a separate committee on political education that we can voluntarily contribute to so that um, our union can advocate on Capitol Hill and all across this country uh, for legislation to be passed and improved uh, that affects not only us as flight attendants, certainly most importantly, but also generally uh, support, legislation supportive of working class people uh, and working class members of the TWU. And so I encourage everybody when we have the opportunity to sign up for COPE and then make those uh, voluntary contributions as a way of, of influencing legislation positively that impacts all of us. Um, Lastly, on the on the general and miscellaneous, there's a good good language and good section on the submissions to our personnel files when it comes to uh, comments or letters written by customers or other crew members, whomever. And 
it goes into great detail about what letters can and cannot be put into our personnel files, um, and IFC's ability to access her or his uh, file in a timely manner, and we can we will have the ability to do so um, at any time, uh, and also prohibits certain types of letters that don't have uh, the necessary, and I apologize if you can hear the dog barking in the background, but they don't have the necessary um, uh, or are too vague or are uh, not follow what the contract stipulates as to whether they can be in or out of your uh, personnel file. And I'll, I'll leave it there if, uh, I know we have other things we wanna cover on the call, so I don't wanna go on too long, but these are hugely important articles, especially those grievance and system board of adjustment articles. So definitely review those and, and understand how significant those are to changing our uh, job security and our ability to come to work and feel safe and secure and able to perform our duties uh, professionally as we always do without the fear of, of worrying whether the company will be able to unilaterally discipline me or terminate me as an at-will employee. And uh, once we ratify this contract, we will no longer be at-will employees. And it's because of that grievance procedure, just cause provision. So thanks. All right, thank you, Brendan. It is now 7.30. I'm gonna have Travis open up our chat so that people who um, would like to ask questions, especially if they are specific to Article 20, 21, 22, and 30, um, they can ask our uh, questions. And as a housekeeping note, if those questions are not answered in this town hall, they will be rolled over so that they can um, we can give our negotiating team the time and the space to research um, and to uh, be able to circle back and give a complete answer um, for the questions that you're asking in the chat. I'm opening it up a little early. I keep forgetting that as someone who has uh, secretarial typing skills, I type way faster than most people. So we're going to give an opportunity for those who either a type a little slower or are typing from their phones, perhaps to be able to um, send in their questions. And again, if they're not answered during this town hall, they will be rolled over and will be addressed in our next town hall. So we're going to go. Um, that completes our article unpacking section. We're going to move on to our next section. That is items to clarify or correct this section um, occurs if for when we either see online or in person any misinformation or misunderstandings that are either in the TA or previously spoken about articles that we could expound upon. So we're, we only have one for tonight. It's um, article 8H7. I'm going to hand that back to Brendan at this time. Thank you. I can get myself unmuted. Sorry, thank you, Taisha. So I, I'll just read this uh, paragraph for everyone because they don't have the, the question in front of them. But the question was in reference to Article 8, um, H7. And it reads, no reassignments will be built with less than 45 minutes turn time for the A321 and 35 minutes for the A320 between segments, except when an IFC has already blocked in from one flight and can realistically make a shorter connection to another flight. So let me just stop there and, and, and go over that sentence first. So what that tells us is that as part of a reassignment, so uh, you're out on the line and uh, crew services contacts you with a reassignment, that <clears throat> reassignment, whatever you're being reassigned to cannot be built. The turn times within those, within that reassignment cannot be built uh, less than 45 minutes, depending on the aircraft, or 35 minutes. And so we know, because we've experienced it, but also all the reports that we've gotten as a negotiating team over the years, that the company likes to finagle the legality of assignments and reassignments based on building unrealistic turn times. So, uh, you know, you'll have 20 minutes to turn an aircraft. Uh, all of us know and the company knows that that's completely unfeasible and unrealistic to use a term. So 
that's 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 the first thing. Second of all, if you've already blocked in and there is an assignment for you or a reassignment for you, and for example, there's an aircraft waiting to be boarded and you're required to to operate that leg, then yes, you're already there and you're able to the the you were you will be able to realistically get to where you need to be uh, in shorter amount of time than the 45 to 35 minutes the aircraft could be boarded, for example. So that's the second part of that sentence. Let me continue reading. If turn times become shortened by irregular operations, which occur after the IFC has been rescheduled, then the reassignment remains legal. The company will not schedule unrealistic turn times in order to keep the IFC legal. So what this, the second sentence reads is that if you are in LAX and you're getting ready to uh, depart for San Francisco on your way to New York and you're <clears throat> reassigned, the turn times cannot be, they must meet these stipulations, 35 or 45 minutes at the time of reassignment. If subsequently you are delayed as part of the operation, those and, and those turn times are shortened subsequently, that remains a legal reassignment. However, when, you're be, when you are reassigned and when cruise services is making the reassignment, they cannot build a pairing in order to keep you, for example, under 14 hours of scheduled duty for that day. They can't schedule you with a 25 minute turn, a 15 minute turn, which we've seen in the past. This was language that we fought uh, hard for um, because of the implications of it, uh, and one that we are super excited to have gained. And just like any language in our agreement, this is language that if we see, once we've ratified our agreement, that the company is continuing as they have in the past to abuse this in order to uh, use flight attendants that otherwise would not be legal. Uh, you know, shuffling times on the paper in order to just keep uh, uh, flight attendants legal. That's something that will be going forward, a violation of the contract. And as we discussed earlier on the call, will be subject to the grievance procedure and our union will certainly uh, not hesitate to do so if need be uh, in this instance or otherwise. So um, that this language, thank you for, for the question. It's, it's uh, good good clarification there. So I hope I was able to do that. All right, perfect. Thank you for this clarification. That was for Article 8, H7. I've also put that in a chat for memorialization um, so that others reading the chat can see what exactly is being read um, and what Brendan is clarifying. So we're going to move on for to our next section. That was our only clarifying uh, item that we had for tonight again, pulls from submitted questions from the uh, website. So these are questions that were actually rolled over from our previous town hall that was submitted to our b6.tw.org website. This question is from Andre. He is asking um, for new bases, how do new bases work? And is it by seniority? And this is gonna go to Stacy. Hi, everyone. Um, so for new bases, and uh, I believe we are specifically talking about uh, Newark here, um, bases are always staffed by seniority. Um, so we know from the contract that uh, Newark is no longer going to be a co-base of JFK as of this summer in June. Um, after that time, at the company's discretion, they um, they can choose to designate that as a base. Um, but in order to do that, there has to be a bid. Everyone has the opportunity to participate in a system bid. Uh, those go by seniority like so many things in our industry, um, like almost all things in our industry actually. And uh, so you're gonna look at article 13 and you're going to see the procedure for system bids. Um, voluntary transfers are awarded in seniority order involuntary transfers, of course, are in inverse seniority order. 
And uh, then we have a process for secondary vacancies. We have added a process for uh, contingency bids in the system bid. So you may choose to bid based on where you will fall on the seniority list. Um, if you don't like where you're gonna fall on the list, then you can bypass that option. Um, so that's a wonderful thing. Now, if, if they choose not to um, uh, you know, designate Newark as a base right away, uh, there's, a, there's a lag, one way or the other, come June, Newark will not be a base at such time. If they want to operate flying out of Newark, they will have to operate that as a limo, which you are paid for, uh, for your time as they have done in the past. Um, I know the question of the transit checks uh, came up and transit checks are a negotiated benefit, not between the union and the company. The transit checks are ben a benefit that is negotiated between the company and the local transit authority. So that is something that the company negotiates in order to uh, promote public transportation and exchange, they get a credit for it. And, um, and that is why those happen. So we have them for JFK um, and any JFK co-base. Uh, if Newark were to become a base then uh, at that time, I would imagine because it does share um, some transit systems, we would, uh, we would definitely look into if the company is going to be negotiating um, transit checks for that base. Um, additionally, uh, if you go to Article 14, and this is an article that is a complete win, we have the moving expenses. And that's going to cover when you have your moves at the IFC's expense versus company paid moves, again, involuntary transfers are going to be paid, moves within a certain or outside of a certain distance are going to be paid. And that's just a complete win for us. And that, uh, that about covers the, uh, the concept of new bases. All right, that was Stacy answering the question that was from Andre about Newark and it being um, and what it looks like for possibly Newark becoming a base and that um, I'm really out. Uh, and again, Newark is by seniority and we do as a housekeeping note, as a reminder, our lump sum payment, it is not a bonus. Our lump sum payment is a payment of $14.50 and that is not by seniority. So though a lot of things are given out by seniority, a lump sum payment does not require seniority or a performance initiative in order for that to trigger. So we're going to move on. We're going to go to our next question. That is from Carlos. And Carlos wants to ask, what benefits do junior in-flight crew members have in our TA2? That question is going to D. D is our negotiating team representative, fabulous, from Fort Lauderdale. And I'm going to hand it to her. Thank you. Thank you, Taisha. Um, thank you, Carlos, for the question. And what I'd like to do is highlight some of the big changes in reserve that we were able to get. So um, one of the, the best things I think is uh, the reserve balancing. If you haven't been a part of that before, you'll have an opportunity to read about that under your reserve contract, but it gives you um, more level playing field to get out of some days that you want to work, possibly holidays, uh, other reasons. It's, you know, bad day, bad day, you'll be able to swap. You have also received that you will not have any ASB after a pairing unless it's in a level two or higher, and you will never have any ASB after a pairing if a duty day is more than eight hours. If you're on our wrap before 1300, you will not be assigned any red eyes. You will also be able to be auto released the last day of your reserve after six hours or 1800, 1800 hours base local. The big win, I think the biggest win is Newark is no longer a co-base for you at JFK. Uh, we know that's been a very big hardship financially for all of our reserves. You'll also get to preference your assignments for the next day assignments. Now you'll have four choices. You'll be able to choose from AM, AM PM, airport standby or select pairings in open time. 
Another big win is your day off encroachment pairing. So it is after 359. If you arrive back into your base after 359, you'll have a choice uh, to either receive a 4.12, which would go above your guarantee, or a mutually agreed day off, if you had the day off or you want the day off. And if you used PTO, that PTO would be returned to your bank. Um, there's lots more, I think, like for reserves, but uh, those are the top ones that I think that will be the very well accepted. I wanna remind people too that reserves are gonna get two raises every year. You're gonna get your date of hire raise and you're also gonna get our ratification date of signing raise. So you'll be getting two raises every year and our most junior crew members will get the biggest overall percentage in the pay scale. So just for instance, if you're a brand new hire, you're gonna start at $21 an hour. And by the fifth year of this contract, you will be uh, very high up in the 30s. So that, that's a significant difference. Um, I don't have the actual number because I didn't highlight it in the contract. It's under compensation though, you can read the pay scale. And if you have any trouble reading the pay scale on how it goes, because we're talking about significant raises for junior people, your raises go down and across. So every year you'll go down and across. I suggest that if you have an opportunity to read the town hall or listen to the town hall from November 18th, because there's a lot of information on that too. I hope this answers your question. All right, thank you, Dee. That was um, uh, Dee answering the question from Carlos. We're gonna move on to the next question. This question is gonna be taken by Ernesto. Uh, this is from Melissa. Explain how you negotiated dependability. Hey, everybody. Um, like you said, Miss Melissa sent this in. Hope this finds you well, Melissa. We weren't able actually to negotiate dependability. Uh, something the company wasn't willing to uh, to buy down. However, we were able to maintain the uh, 12 month roll off for any uh, points accumulated. Whereas in this instance, the uh, company wanted 18, 18 months. Um, so we were able to maintain the 12 month. Um, more importantly, or um, as it is a hot, a hot um, point of discussion, is the uh, a solid uh, definition of our critical coverage period. You know, and matter of fact, I'm gonna go just read it real quick verbatim off uh, definitions articles, article four, page 10, if anybody wants to um, read along. It says, um, a defined period of days in which due to pre-designated holidays, so Thanksgiving, Christmas, to name, to name a few, or a minimum of 24 hours at a level three, so not level one or two, Level three IROP status, unplanned in-flight crew absences during the year will result in, in pairings or reserve assignments that leave the operation more vulnerable to delays and, cas and cancellations. So none of this, none of this, you know, hey, uh, we're having a hard time running our operation adequately. So next week we have a uh, critical coverage foolery nonsense that we've had to uh, endure this last half of the year or possibly even more. Um, a grievance process um, as uh, Stacy, Sonia and, and Brendan um, nicely articulated earlier. Um, a grievance process to dispute any attendance events and resolve them to prevent any un undue discipline. Also, you know, because we didn't necessarily agree with the, uh, we didn't agree with the um, attendance policy, we can now use a grievance process to challenge it if and when need be. So, hope that helps. Uh all right, thank you, Ernesto. Um, Ernesto was asked, uh, answering Melissa's question, explain how you negotiated dependability. Our next question is from Kathleen. The company should pay for a doctor's visit when they require it. Was this brought up to the judge in the case? So this is gonna, who's taking this question? I could take it. Okay. Okay, so I believe there, this is in relation to the uh, various lawsuits that are out there for the uh, sick time. So um, unfortunately the judge made the decision based on a previous decision that had not been recently ruled and did not allow TW to make our case in court. And that 
does go back to the fact that we're only under negotiations. And while though we are currently being represented, we don't have a contract. So TWU cannot truly be there on our behalf. You know, they, they can advocate for us, but they're not legally able to represent us uh, in that instance. So um, there are several pending cases in the courts regarding employee sick leave that the TWU is assisting and watching us watching closely so that when we do have the opportunity, we can go back there and, uh, and file that again. All right, thank you. That question was from Kathleen and it was answered by Sonia. We're gonna move on to the next question. Uh, this question is going to D. Uh, this is from Anonymous. They had asked, why is JetBlue the only airline that does not let us drop to zero if the grid is green? Um, also, ex, uh, other airlines require X amount of hours to be completed if you have medical. Delta is at 540. Um, so we are going to talk about dropping to zero as well as the amount of hours required as it relates to medical. And I'm going to shoot this back to D because D has also answered some a few of these questions before in previous town halls. If again you want to go to the YouTube channel, um, and she has been handling a lot of questions as it relates to crew flex and uh, reduced credit flying, as well as our medical benefits as it relates to part-time and full-timers. So I'm gonna pass this to Dee, thank you. Okay, so drop into zero. JetBlue is not the only airline does that, that does not allow flight attendants to drop to zero. And there are some other companies that are allowing flight attendants to drop to zero. Many of the companies do not have the premium pay scale um, that JetBlue offers. So there's not a huge difference for those flight attendants that are picking up something and then picking up something else, dropping it and picking up something else because it's not at a premium pay. So while the NT was unable to um, make a major win, we did get reduced credit window. Dropping down to zero is actually a huge cost factor when the pairings are picked up by someone who can pick them up at premium pay. All right, thank you. And again, as a housekeeping note, premium pay is a unique uh, structure to our specific in-flight group. Again, this is Correct. a priority. Um, it's not industry standard. This is a unique cultural work group uh, structure that many of us have advocated to keep. And also, um, just as a reminder that the trigger is where many of us asked for the trigger for premium pay to be, um, to be, to, to happen. So the, uh, the next part of that question is if you're a line holder and have been removed from your pairing and are pay protected, um, they would like to be released no RSL or home reserve. Um, this particular comment is going to be answered by Stacy. Hi. Um, so being removed and, um, and not having to sit RSL, obviously that is something that we fought hard for. Uh, something I personally would have absolutely loved to have seen. Um, however, I, I do want to clear up. Many flight attendant contracts do not require flight attendants who have been released um, or, or do require, sorry, do require flight attendants who have been uh, removed from parents to be um, rescheduled or to have to sit reserve in order to be compensated or you can be released and have to pick up in order to keep the, uh, the pay protection and you know, personally, if I'm going to be forced to pick up within a certain period of uh, time to keep my pay protection, that might as well be almost RSL because I'm still going to be forced to pick up something I don't want uh, in order to keep my pay. So uh, what we did gain, and I think we made for, especially for a first contract, immense gains on this one. We're really proud of this. Um, we have an entire new category of, of trips to be removed from. So you can be displaced or you can be non-displaced. If you are displaced, that means your pairing was the problem. If you are non-displaced, it means that someone else's pairing was the problem. Um, this plane is coming in and it's, uh, it's you know, there's something wrong. They, they're not gonna have the crew or they need um, to get this other plane out, whatever the case may be, they're pulling you off your perfectly good pairing in order to crew a different pairing, that pairing is the problem. 
Uh, in that case, you are non-displaced. Non-displaced IFCs do not have to sit RSL. So right off the bat, that's fantastic. Um, you will not be sitting RSL if you are a non-displaced IOC, so get used to that new definition. Uh, we also negotiated the release with pay within 72 hours of report. I know that's been something that we've been doing for a little while now, but um, that is actually something that was negotiated by your union. Um, and we have the auto release with pay on the day of the pairing. So um, there's, not, um, there's not anything going on. They have enough coverage with regular reserves and they will auto release IFCs who are in RSL. Um, and we eliminated line holder standby at the airport entirely. There is no airport standby for line holder IFCs unless the IFC chooses to do so. So we think that's a fantastic win. All right, thank you, Stacy. The next question is from Deetra. Um, this has been um, a little bit touched on earlier in this town hall. It's from Deetra. How will the process work as far as AM, PM and ASB preferences work? Who wants to take this question and our negotiating team? I can take it if any, Dee, did you want it? She said no. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Just <laughs> It will, it, the, this was something that we fought hard for, for our reserves, something that we've uh, heard the company talk about in the past, um, you know, it, trying out to see how it works. Um, it, it took our union to come and uh, get this win for our reserves. And we are uh, excited for you all to have this opportunity once we ratify the agreement. But as Dee mentioned earlier on the call, actually, it will go just as it does today. Uh, all, all of our um, reserves have as part of the next day reserve assignment process, the ability to prep, prep bid for pairings in open time. What we were able to do is not only now will our reserves continue to have that ability to prep bid trips, but also she or he will be able to prep bid for uh, the reserve availability period that she or he prefers. So. Uh, we, and that also leads into the fact that we were able to gain AM and PM reserve availability periods, which we don't currently have. And so if you want to be on an AM schedule, if you're an early morning person or your circadian rhythms are on that pattern, you can preference to be assigned uh, a reserve availability period in the AM window. You can also preference a PM reserve if you prefer those. And lastly, you can preference if you wish for airport standby. Uh, and all of those preferences will be processed in, in seniority order and assigned as, as per the contract. Um, and so that is, that, is, that is definitely a huge win for the reserves. All right, that answers that question. As a housekeeping note, um, we talked about this, I believe, in the last town hall about the hybrid lines and move up lines, um, as well as the gain for a carrying credit if there were a line holder in a previous month to count towards reserve days, um, where right now it actually count, currently counts against their days off. So that is a housekeeping note for that. We're going to move on to our last question. This is from Bilta. I apologize if I have pronounced your name wrong. I apologize. Um, we are not a nine to five business. Yes, uh, airline industry is 24 7, 365. Can we pick up our transit check as long as there is a leadership or supervisor in the office? Uh, who wants to take that question? Ernesto or Stacy? I can do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, you know, we've asked, um, I, quite frankly, I can't understand the, the logic at even slightly of why they, they would choose to do this this way. Again, knowing what our schedules are like um, and knowing that they have supervisors in the office, um, it's just quite frankly at this point unfathomable to me. But ultimately, uh, it is something we'd like to fix. It's something we'd like to uh, achieve. The, the hope is that once the, uh, the airline is used to having a union on board, and once they have started uh, fostering a relationship with us and our local, 
um, you know, we can have a less punitive, more collaborative relationship with leadership once we are ratified and, and we get going and, and things settle down. Um, we really just, we wanna write the ship and create policies that make sense. So hopefully they'll be willing to work with us on that. All right, and that actually concludes our town hall. I'm gonna give you back five minutes of your time. We started five minutes after the hour. We are pretty much at the top of the hour. Again, any questions that were typed and presented in this town hall is going to be rolled over and answered in our next town hall. And we appreciate our negotiating team for donating their time and energy and labor, and not only negotiating this contract, but sitting in all nine of these town halls and answering any clarification clarifying questions so that we can gain understanding as it relates to our TA2. So thank you all, everyone else who has joined as our viewing audience, and we hope to see you again tomorrow. That is at 10 a.m. is our next town hall meeting at 10 a.m., and we hope you have a good evening. Take care.